Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Omar. I'm really excited to be here, my first EUC. Um, so as Ulf mentioned, I uh, am part of a knowledge transfer partnership between Erlang Solutions and University of Kent. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a bit about Erlang Embedded. Um, you might have seen our videos already featuring blinking lights. Uh, but today, I'm going to talk a bit more about, um, well, slightly more important stuff than blinking lights. Um, so we're going to have a look at what the KTP project is, uh, what are the objectives within, uh, set within the project, um, challenges in modern embedded systems, how we can tackle them using Erlang, of course, uh, current state of Erlang in the embedded domain, what people are doing with it, um, and our plans for Erlang embedded um, at ESL, and finally, uh, we'll have some time for questions. So the knowledge transfer partnership, uh, you might have seen this at Ulf's um, slide at the EUC last year. Um, so the person he mentioned is me. Um, I'm the uh, KTP guy at the ESL. Um, it's a government funded scheme where um, a company and a university or an educational institute is paired up uh, so that there's a um, flow of data, um, knowledge from you know, both entities. Uh, and Sorry? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, and the main objective is the, of the KTP is to look at how we can um, get Erlang accepted as one of the languages uh, considered or used in the embedded uh, projects. Um, so, well, it clearly states the aim it over there uh, is to bring the benefits of concurrent systems development using Erlang to the field of embedded systems through investigation, analysis, software development, and evaluation. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Um, so let's have a look at the challenges in embedded systems. I'm pretty sure you're all aware of this, um, but just a recap of what we're dealing with. Um, so we have larger and um, ridiculously complex systems. Um, cores are very cheap these days. You get many, many cores. And with many, many cores and multi-cores, uh, you have the pleasure of, um, well, dealing with the horrible standard development tools. Um, you can't really uh, try to, you know, watch your variables over JTAG if you have 16 cores. That's not fun. Um, so people quite, use, quite often uh, resort to using um, some sort of framework on top of the metal, bare metal, to uh, be able to utilize uh, the full potential uh, of the cores available within the system. So uh, gone are the days where you can simply do some registered twiddling to get stuff done. Um, so we also have increasingly higher degrees of heterogeneity. Uh, we have hardware acceleration in the form of GPUs, core processors. Uh, you can now get mobile phones with four cores plus a GPU bolted on it. Um, it's quite fascinating, really. We also have different kinds of interconnects, the way these communicate, these different processes communicate, and also the memory of hierarchies are different as well. Um, we also have the um, limitation that these devices need to run on batteries. They have to be mobile um, sometimes. And it's nice being able to run you know, 16 cores at the same time, but how much power is that going to consume? And they also need to be uh, always connected, which requires uh, the tools you're using to be aware of the network and all the communication uh, primitives that are provided to you in, in the system. And we also have this wonderful thing called the Internet of Things. I'm sure you've heard of this as well. Um, and embedded systems do play a key part in this. Um, there's a company um, who is planting sensors on cattle um, and monitoring them. Um, so internet or cows. Um, and here, we may not necessarily run Erlang on a cow, but uh, we can use Erlang um, to, well, collect data from cow um, and process it. Um, so these next two slides are mainly for the benefit of the people who are watching at home. Um, it seems almost criminal to talk about Erlang in, in the room of, well, people invented Erlang. Um, so Erlang is declarative, therefore you can create nicely uh, structured, uh, very concise and readable um, programs with it. Um, it almost, I'm, I'm from a hardware background, so it almost reminds me of hardware description languages somewhat. Um, 
it does give you concurrency and parallelism. Um, on multi-core embedded processes, you quite often run Erlang on Linux with SMP support, so you can utilize the SMP features uh, or the SMP support of Erlang runtime as well. So you can take full advantage of the multi-cores available in your embedded system. It's robust. Um, we've heard um, some strategies on dealing with error recovery and stuff in the previous talk. Uh, and it's also portable and distributed. Uh, you can run it on a variety of different platforms. Uh, so you can pretty much run, well, not the same uh, distribution, of course, but you can run the same version of Erlang um, on your server and on your mobile uh, application as well. So um, it's much easier to manage than having to maintain different versions of your tools. Um, and in an embedded system, you quite often have to interface external devices um, to your system. And Erlang provides NIFs and ports, or the NIF and port features to be able to do that. Uh, you can quite easily interface sensors or actuators into your system. Uh, I will talk a bit more about it when I get to the buggy. Um, it, it, it has soft real-time features. Uh, it, unfortunately, on the standard distribution does not have hard real-time, but I'll get to that in a minute as well. Um, it has a per-process garbage collection, and it's, it's generally fast. I mean, the response time isn't that bad, even on, without fine-tuning it. Um, so these were the advantages of Erlang. Oh, of course, sorry. And there's support for hot code loading, which gives you the um, well, luxury of providing uh, or doing dynamic reconfiguration without having to restart your system or um, stop the system and then load uh, new code in it. Um, so there are some limitations to Erlang as well, unfortunately. The first one being um, that in the standard Erlang distribution running on a standard Linux distribution, you don't have hard real-time. I, I know there are people working on it, and I, I think there will be a lightning talk uh, in the evening about it as well. Um, looking forward to hearing about it. Um, and you also need an, well, you need an operating system like Linux to run it, so it does not run on bare metal. So you have uh, some memory requirements and space requirements to um, fulfill just so that you can get Erlang up and running. Um, and also, we don't have a lack of, well, we don't have a unified hardware or a peripheral abstraction library. This, this is, I find this a bit strange because Erlang was designed for embedded applications, embedded systems. Yet, the message seems to have got, gotten lost along the way. It's a great tool for building massively scalable systems now. But I think it's time we look into the origins of Erlang, as in how can we get back to running Erlang on these um, plentiful and cheap hardware that is available for us. So with all those features and limitations, uh, I think it's fair to say that Erlang can be the orchestrator of things or the maestro of the system. Um, and this is generally what have been done and what people have been doing um, in the embedded space. Um, so how do we actually run Erlang in embedded devices? You can simply cross-compile it. Or if you have a tool chain up and running on your little board, you can just compile it there. You have to dis uh, spec uh, disable certain features, sorry. Um, but generally, everything compiles fine. And you can also try running it on bare metal. I think this is uncharted territories. Um, and yeah, if, if you're interested in this, let's find me. Let's have, let's, let's have a chat after this. Um, we, we have companies utilizing Erlang in their embedded products already. Uh, we're going to hear more about FOIA Labs later today, I think. And we have um, Travelping utilizing Erlang uh, in their sort of offerings. We have community interest as well. So we have Frank Hunleth, um, who has created a build root configuration for BeagleBone, uh, which lets you run Erlang quite easily. So here are some tweets I scoured of Twitter. Um, we have Niklas running, well, you com using Erlang to communicate with, it, with his Lego Mindstorms. And we also have a quite recent addition of an OpenWRT recipe um, of the Erlang packages. So, well, embedded hardware today is cheap and plentiful. I mean, for 
a very small amount of money, you can get a very powerful processing uh, board. Um, so we have, on this picture, we have gumsticks, beagle bones, raspberry pi, um, some Arduinos thrown in for good measure. Um, and one of these gets a special mention in these slides, and that's the Raspberry Pi. So you must have heard of this um, platform that has taken the world by storm. Um, it's essentially a credit card-sized uh, computer with a 700 megahertz processor in it and 256 megabytes of RAM. Use the Ethernet, USB, HDMI, and all that for $35. It's quite remarkable. Um, I mean, the entry barrier to start playing with embedded stuff is pretty much shattered. You can easily justify spending $35 on a small computer. Um, an interesting thing about the Raspberry Pi is the actual foundation, the Raspberry Pi Foundation is a charity, and their mission statement is to promote the study of computer science. Um, and this is very exciting because if we can create fun applications or fun little demos, we can get young people interested in Erlang, and they might become future Erlang hackers, maybe. So for that reason, uh, I have created this tiny robot platform um, called the Earl Buggy. Um, it's, in its current configuration, it's just a line follower robot. I will be adding more stuff on it uh, at later stages. But I created this because I wanted to demonstrate how um, nicely you can abstract away hardware peripherals or uh, components within your system nicely into little Erlang modules. So the Earl buggy has motors and sensors. Um, and the way I implemented the control logic is that I have um, a motor controller that communicates with those motors as, well, they are separate processes. And then I also have a NIF um, that uh, talks to the pulse width modulation controller in hardware that sets the speed of the motor. Uh, and I also I have sensors that send their values to the brain constantly, and the brain essentially makes a decision whether to uh, move left or right, and it also adjusts speed. Um, so you can see that you can, these are the peripherals of the system of the robot. We have sensors, uh, actuators, motors, um, and you can very nicely map those into Erlang processes. So this is a nice way of, well, using processes as compositional units within your system is an exciting um, thing, I think. So how do we control a motor? Quite simply, by sending messages to it. Uh, this could be any peripheral. I mean, the motor is just a very simple example. That's why I've chosen this. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this um, demonstrates how we can abstract things um, into their own little modules. So, okay, this was just an example, but can we actually provide a generic abstraction to, um, that, we, that can be applied or that can be mapped to other embedded peripherals? Well, we can uh, follow a layered model where we'll have a, who? Component API that will be specific to a component. In, in the previous case, it was a motor, for instance. And we can have a lo lower layer peripheral API that maps to um, hardware resources. So again, it was just GPIO pins, general purpose IO pins. And these, these could be, and also underneath that, we have a, a platform specific or hardware specific peripheral implementation. Um, so the blue bits, the component API and the peripheral API can be universal. In other words, we can use those in different boards without having to change them. Uh, and if we follow this layered architecture, um, and the yellow bits, the actual implementation can be platform specific. So if we look at an example, uh, let's say we have a nice I squared C temperature sensor. Uh, we can quite simply have a little sensor API. Um, this is a temperature sensor, so we'll probably have get temperature reading, calibrate, um, a few functions like that, that can communicate with the I2C bus driver. Again, these are generic components. Um, and you can choose to use the I2C um, module in the SysFS. Or if you're on BSD, you can use SysControl. Or you can just memory map the registers and do some crazy stuff with them. Um, so regardless of the underlying um, primitive layer, um, you can choose to have the same API for your peripherals and your components. 
uh, we're going to be exploring this uh, in the future, and um, I've already uh, published some code for the Raspberry Pi, um, and I'll do a major revamp of those and push them to GitHub so you can have a play with it on your Pi as well. So, what are at ESL, we're really excited about embedded stuff, and uh, we've set a few goals. And one of them, or the first and foremost, uh, is to establish a user community uh, following uh, existing successful models. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about it in the next slide. But we'd like to bring everyone together uh, who uses emb embedded Erlang, because at the moment, everyone's doing um, sort of this disjointed um, efforts which sometimes overlap massively. So if we can bring everyone together, um, I think you know, we can see some great results out of that, coming out of that. Um, we also will look at how we can design a generic framework that will allow, allow Erlang programmers to interface um, the platform that they're using to a range of embedded peripherals or devices. Um, and we'll also develop tools and libraries that will um, make life easier for people who are just getting started with embedded development or seasoned embedded developers who are just getting started with Erlang. Um, so to help those, oh, okay, I'll talk about the community approach first. Um, have you heard of a project called Arduino? It's, it's extremely popular. I, th I think it could be called as the poster child for the open hardware movement. Um, Arduino essentially is, is a, co a combination of three things. So you have this cheap um, hardware platform, self-contained. You don't need external programmers for it. Just plug a printer cable uh, to it, a USB cable to it, and you have the programmer and um, your actual microcontroller ready. Um, there's a nice IDE with all the software libraries and uh, programming tools and everything integrated. And there's also a very useful community that is willing to answer any question that you might have. So, I mean, of course we can't map Erlang embedded directly onto this, but I think this is a great model. Um, and we're nearly there. I mean, we have the hardware platforms. You can have a Raspberry Pi for $35, or if you don't want to wait, you can get a Beagle Bone for, well, not much more money than that. Um, slightly more expensive. Um, we are trying to establish a community of Erlang embedded hackers together so that um, we can you know, start exploring things together. And also, we, we're going to work on creating um, a nice and simple set of software libraries that will make life easier for the um, early adopters and then developers after that. Um, also, we've started publishing these uh, little video tutorials. Um, well, I'll be doing more of that when I get back to London. Um, but the idea here is to just Pick a very simple example. So in, in the second one, for instance, we just blinked a few LEDs together, uh, demonstrating concurrency. Um, on the third one, uh, we decided to see how many processes we could spawn on the Raspberry Pi. And the answer is 136,000 Erlang processes. Um, so episode four might be Earl buggy, or episode five might be driving an LCD screen. So if you have any ideas about these, please let us know. Uh, we will keep publishing these um, just to show that Erlang is actually a very nice tool to play with embedded. Um, we also have erlangembedded.com. This is our temporary website at the moment. Uh, we're waiting for the uh, larger community site to go online. I don't think I can talk much about it. Um, but once it goes live, um, the Erlang embedded community will be uh, moving there. Oops. And Along the way, we have some great projects and great tools that we are using. So we're truly standing on the shoulders of giants. So we have um, Open Embedded, Buildroot, Yocto, Angstrom, uh, in the software side of things. These are um, sort of Linux distribution frameworks, perhaps, um, that lets you create really sort of fine-tuned uh, little images for your systems. Uh, so I mean, you can, for instance, on the Pi, you can just download a Debian image or a Fedora image, or you can choose to um, really fine tune what you include into your image and redu to reduce the size down and um, perhaps other tweaks as well. And on the hardware front, we have Beagle Boards, Beagle Bones, Raspberry Pi, Gumsticks, and many other uh, ARM-based devices that, uh, that is available for us. So 
Feature explorations, this is quite exciting because um, this is a new device from Xilinx that uh, they announced a couple of months ago. Um, Xilinx is an FPGA company, so their business is, well, creating um, field programmable gate arrays. But in this uh, processor, processing platform, or the extensible processing platform, they call it, the ARM core, the, there's a dual core ARM processor in there, and that actually is the primary uh, processing device in there. So what I mean by that is when the device boots, I think, if I remember correctly, the ARM core takes control and then uses the FPGA logic as a coprocessor. In the past, this was the opposite. So in Vertex series, uh, you had PowerPC, um, hard IP blocks in there, or hardcore processor in there, uh, but you had to utilize um, logic resources or um, a small um, soft core processor to, uh, to initialize it and so on. Um, the point is, we have a dual core ARM processor on it that can run Erlang quite easily because it runs Linux. Uh, and we have direct access to uh, programmable logic blocks in there, or high-speed transceivers in there. So what this means is we can actually uh, control hardware, true, truly custom-defined hardware from Erlang in this uh, computing fabric. Um, these devices are not out yet, uh, or unless you're a very big company, Xilinx doesn't want to talk to you. Um, so once we can get our hands on a development board, we'll start looking into how we can utilize it, or is it feasible to utilize it. Um, so please get involved if you'd like to uh, learn more about uh, Erlang Embedded, or if you're already using Erlang in, the, in your embedded projects. Um, and in conclusion, I think um, Erlang Embedded is a very exciting proposal. Uh, we already have done some uh, exploratory work uh, in terms of getting it running on uh, or interacting with true embedded peripherals uh, and components. Uh, we'll be doing more of that, and we are really interested in hearing um, your comments and suggestions. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>